Let's open our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter number 3 this morning. 1 Samuel chapter number 3. As we continue our series, Can You Hear Me Now? And we began this series by just talking about the importance of taking time to listen to God. We listen to so many things. There's so many distractions in our world between television and podcasts, social media. All this stuff is just like fighting to get our attention. And there's times where we just need to shut all that down. We need to turn the news off, turn the radio off, and just take time listening to what God has for us. And as we begin to look at the different ways that God speaks to us, really uh, knowing the ways that God speaks to us doesn't help us at all if we don't take time to listen to God and hear what He has to say. And so we opened up by just talking about the importance of listening to God. And I want to encourage you this week to spend some time just listening, not talking, not thinking, not doing Just, God, I'm quiet. I want you to speak to me. And we noted that the very first way, the most important way that God speaks to us is through his word. And most of what God wants to tell you is found right in the Bible. It's not found through other means. And any other way that God speaks to us is filtered through his word. Because God will never speak to us in different forms, in different ways that contradict what he's already told us in his word. That's why it's important for you to read the Bible. That's why it's important for you to study it, to memorize it, to know it for yourself. So as these other voices and other things try to grab our attention, we can immediately discern if it's something from God or if it's something from someone else. And last week we talked about how God speaks to us through doors opening up opportunities, shutting down opportunities. And many times he leads and guides and directs our lives through these open and closed doors. And we're at a time where, uh, because of what's going on in our country, the doors to physical church building locations is closing. That doesn't mean the church is closed. Remember, the church is a people, so... Wherever we're gathering together today, we're the church. And the church is meeting all around the world in homes, online, in little communities today. And I'm so thankful for that. But just because we have a a closed door in one aspect, I believe God's opening wide a door to get real and personal and loving and helpful with the people that are in our lives. So let's make sure that we're taking the opportunities that are afforded to us at this time. Now we're here in 1 Samuel chapter number 3, and this is our main text for this entire series as we're asking the question of whether or not we're listening to what God wants to tell us. Beginning in verse number 1, it says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. The word of the Lord was precious. That means it was rare in those days. And it explains why it was so rare. It says because there was no open vision. In other words, God was not just speaking audibly at that point to a lot of people. He wasn't just moving in dreams and visions to a bunch of people at that time. So when God did speak audibly and reach out to somebody, that was so rare And, of course, it's rarity that makes something very precious. Verse 2 says, And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. That the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. Now notice his actions. He hears his name. He runs unto Eli in verse 5 and says, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for thou did call me. And he answered, I called not my son. Lie down again. 
Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And the idea is that it's not that he was ignorant of who God was. I mean, he's here in the temple for the purpose of serving God. He's dedicated to serving God. Remember his mother, when she was praying and weeping and asking for God to open up her womb and to give her a child, she said, hey, if you give me a son, then I will give him back to you. And that's why he was at the temple. She, was, she honored her commitment to God. So it's not that he didn't know who God was, but he didn't have this personal connection yet. A personal connection where God would speak to him and he would hear and know God's voice. So it says he didn't yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. The Lord called Samuel again the third time. He arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I. Thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down. And it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord. Thy servant hears. And that ought to be the prayer of every single one of our hearts this morning. God, I know you want to speak to me. I'm listening. And there ought to be a time every single day where we just stop and make that prayer. And, and at the beginning of the day would be the best time so that as we move about our day, our ears are open, ready for God to speak to us. Whether it's God speaking through his word, whether it's God speaking through open doors, closed doors, whether it's God speaking through people as we're going to talk about today. And making that prayer, God, I'm your servant Speak to me. I'm listening. I'm ready to receive what it is that you have for me. The Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to assemble together, Lord all over the community, uh, online and everywhere else, and thankful for the body of Christ that you have assembled here. And I pray that you would continue to use your word and this series to speak to our hearts. And God, right now, in the quietness of each of our hearts, and some in our homes, we're making this prayer, God, speak to us. We are your servants and we are listening and we're ready to receive what you have for us. And this morning as we focus in on the fact that God, you speak through people. I pray that our ears would be open to the messages that you have given to others specifically for us. And Lord, that we would allow ourselves to be used as a vessel to speak to the people that are in our lives. Lord, work in our hearts through these moments that we have together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we've been reminded that it is the Bible through which everything else is filtered. So as God speaks to us through open doors, it's filtered through that. As God speaks through closing doors, it's filtered through His Word. And this morning as we focus in on the people that God brings into our lives to speak to us, everything that they say to us ought to be filtered through the Word of God and what God says because He will never contradict His Word. Now, God does speak to us through people. And it's not the primary way that God speaks to us. The, the Word is the primary way, but He does use people to speak to our lives. And God often gives a message for us to someone else to deliver. And there's been times in my life where God has given a message for me to someone else so that they could speak into my life. In fact, just this morning as I wake up, um, I look at my phone and a message pops up from one of, the, one of the senior citizens in our church. Sweet lady, she's been going to this church longer than I've been alive. And she sends me this message, which was something that I needed to hear this morning, and I believe just in preparing this message that God gave a message to me through this dear lady in our church. She says, you are wonderful. Now, there might be some debate upon that with different people in our congregation. You are wonderful. 
But she says, you are wonderful. Just finished reading Galatians and Ephesians and what an awakening uh, I received. You are on the correct path and doing a wonderful job. So glad you are working with our church and keeping us on the path that Jesus wants us to go. Thanks again for all you and your family does for all of us. And man, I just can't tell you what an encouragement that was to me this morning. There's a lot going on and there's some big decisions that have to be made for our church. And here this lady has been, as I mentioned, she's been coming to this church longer than I've been alive. And yet through the different changes and different things and decisions that we've had to make. And she's been there. And she's so supportive, so encouraging. And I don't know if she'll ever know or understand how helpful that this message was to me this morning. I believe that God gave her a message for me so that she could deliver it. And I'm thankful that she delivered it here this morning. God does speak to us through people. The question is, are we listening? Because some of us, we can't, nobody can speak to us. Like, you're not going to tell me anything, and we never listen to what people have to say to us. We never listen to advice, never listen to suggestions, never listen to correction. God wants to speak to us through people. We have to be listening for it. That's why it's so important for us in the morning as we wake up to say, Hey, God, I'm your servant today. Speak to me today. I'm listening. So that when God does send a message to us from somebody else, we're ready to receive it. And we're going to look at just a couple of the ways that God speaks through people into our lives this morning. And the first way is God speaks through people to correct us. This might be one of the hardest because none of us like to be corrected. None of us like to have somebody come up and say, listen, that's not what you should be doing. That's not the way that you should be talking. Nobody likes correction. Now, the reason God does this is because we can't always see our sins and our blind spots. Everybody has blind spots. We all do. There are things that, man, we look at other people and we see it. Like, it's so obvious to us. Like, how in the world could you be raising your kids like that? See, it's so obvious to us. Or, what in the world is wrong with this person? Like, why can they never brush their teeth? Your breath stinks like every single day. How do you miss that? So, there's obvious glaring things in other people's lives that we can see, and we're just kind of, we're blind to our own. And my wife and I have often had this discussion of, what is it in our lives that we just don't see? Where's the blind spot? Because we, we do genuinely want to know. Because know, I know I have a blind spot. Like I know there's things about me that I just can't see. And everybody else is like all you guys are sitting out there going, how does he not know? Well, I don't know. Maybe because you haven't told me. We all have those blind spots. And sometimes it just takes a word from somebody else to help us be able to see it. And one of the things that we need to do in understanding that God does speak to us through people is we need to give people permission to speak into our lives. And there's people in my life that I have given full permission to speak into. Hey, you you tell me whatever you want. You can say whatever to me. I'm open. I'm listening. I'll fully acknowledge everything that you have. And if you see something in my life, some sin, some glaring problem, I want you to come to me and tell me and talk to me and know that I won't be defensive. I won't fight back. I do want to hear. And we need to give permission to people to speak into our lives. We need to be open to others speaking to us. I think of 2 Samuel chapter number 12, we see a good example of this, how God uses someone to speak correction into someone else's life. And here in 2 Samuel chapter number 12, we see the the people involved here is Nathan and David. Nathan said to David, now for those of you that aren't as familiar with this portion of Scripture, 
This, is, this comes up after David committed adultery with Bathsheba. It comes up after he sent Bathsheba's husband to be murdered uh, on the battlefield. So David commits to what we would look at as very large sins. Adultery and murder. Now, for all of us that are sitting out here, everybody watching online... That is something that we can all look at as a glaring issue. We would agree, committing adultery is wrong. Shouldn't do it. We would agree, committing murder is wrong. We shouldn't do it. Okay, that's glaring obvious. Then we have, but it is harder for us to see maybe our own pride. That's a little harder to see. Sometimes it's harder to see our selfishness. It's harder to see the gossip, the backbiting, the complaining. See, we're, we're, we're open and, and we can see very clearly the big things in other people's lives, but sometimes we have a problem with what are some very deep issues in our own lives. But Nathan says to David, Thou art the man. He confronts him on his sin. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto you such and such things. Yeah, what a great thing. He starts off by saying, uh, saying all the great things that God has done for him. Man, I gave you the kingdom. I gave you this. I gave you that. And he, he says, if that would have been too little for you, if that wouldn't have been enough, David, I would have given you whatever you asked me for. I mean, can you imagine having that type of relationship with God? We can. We really can. He says, I would have given you all that. I would have given you more. Then he says in verse number 9, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. See, God uses Nathan To correct David. David, you committed adultery. God did all these things. Gave you all this stuff. Power and authority and people and all these things. I would have given you anything you asked for. So David, why? Why then? Did you take another man's wife? Why then? Did you send him out into the battle to be murdered? And God uses Nathan to correct David. And God's used people in my life to correct me. I grew up in this church and I kind of played the religious game for 18 years. When I was 18 years old, I was almost 19, God used one of my friends, Bethany, to speak into my life. And I remember we were at a we at a park up in Walker, Iowa, at a park, and she confronted me on my relationship with Jesus. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? And God used a message from her to correct me, to correct the course of my life. Because I'd been playing the game, and up until that point, nobody had really personally, like face to face, taken time to Correct me on this area of my life. And I was honest with her that day. I was honest with myself. No, I'm not trusted in Jesus. I know right now, if I died, I would spend an eternity in the lake of fire paying for my sins. But God used her to grab my attention. Just as God used Nathan to grab David's attention, God used her to grab my attention on the issue of salvation and trusting Jesus to be my Savior. And maybe that's what you need this morning, is you need somebody who's going to face-to-face 
challenge you. Say, hey, do you know Jesus? Have you trusted him to be your savior? Not trusted in church, not trusted in baptism, not trusted on being a good person. Have you trusted in what is the only way of salvation? Jesus' death to pay the price for your sins. His burial, taking your sins and punishment with it. His resurrection that offers everlasting life. Have you trusted in the only way of salvation? And here I am speaking into your life this morning. If you've not trusted in Jesus, now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. And so God used Bethany to speak into my life in the area of salvation, but He's used other people as well. I think of my wife. God has used my wife an, a lot to speak into my life to correct me. And I'm thankful for a wife who speaks to me plainly, clearly, lovingly when there's problems. And I remember as we were engaged, we're getting ready to get married, we were out driving somewhere one day and we had car problems. And my temper was so bad. It was so bad. And the car wasn't working. I forget exactly. We had a flat tire or something. And man, I was just so angry. Like the anger just boiled up instantly. And I, would, I, I was punching the steering wheel because I was just so mad. And... Later on, after I'd calmed down, she had a conversation with me. And she said, you have, you have a problem with anger. Like, your temper is out of control, and I will not marry you with your temper like this. I will not. And that was exactly what I needed to hear to, to start a change in my life, in that area of my life. God used a message from my wife to speak to me. And man, it takes a lot of prayer. It takes a lot of memorizing verses on anger and asking God and asking the Holy Spirit to control my temper and give me the self-control. But they had to have the courage to speak into my life. And we need to have the courage to speak into the lives of the people who are around us. It's for their good and for ours. I think of what Galatians 6.1 says. It says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So Paul's writing to the Christians in Galatia, and he says, listen, if you see somebody who has a problem, who's in sin, you have a responsibility to speak to them about it. The Bible talks about speaking the truth in love. And if we can't speak to somebody in a loving attitude with a heart that's motivated to see them have a right relationship with God, then maybe we should let somebody else speak. There's too many people correcting in anger instead of correcting in love. But he says, you have a responsibility to speak to people. To, to deliver that message from God, just as Bethany did in my life, just as my wife has done, just as other people have done in my life. Now, one of the things that we need to do so that we're able to speak into people's lives is we have to make sure we take care of our own faults and sins first. And in Matthew chapter number 7, Jesus talks about that. In Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 1 is probably the most taken out of context verse that there is. It says, Judge not that you be not judged. And people want to take verse number 1 out of context to say, Hey, I can do whatever I want in my life and you can't say anything to me. That's, that's not at all what Jesus was teaching. Okay, the... Jesus didn't say verse 1 and then just stop talking. No, the, the message that he had for them continues. And he explains verse number 1 in the following verses. He says in verse 2, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. 
In other words, you're going to be held to the standard with which you treat somebody else. So the way that I correct somebody else is the way that I'm going to be corrected. The way that I judge somebody else is the way that I'm going to be judged. So he gives us some caution here. That just don't go around judging people. Don't just go around scolding everybody. And man, so people get on social media, they get on Facebook and everything else, and they want to just jump all over people for their theology, for what's going on in life, whatever else. That's not the time or the place to do that. And you'd better be careful. Because when you start calling people out in public, you're going to be judged the same way that you judge somebody else. And there's a lot of people out there just jumping on people in public, in anger, no love. You better be careful. Because eventually that's going to come back around to you. And there's a lot of people that are a bad representation of Jesus. And rather than bringing people back to a right relationship with God, which is, which is what we're supposed to be doing, the whole point of talking to someone about what's going on in their life and the choices that they're making and what they're doing is to bring them to a right relationship with Jesus. But rather than bringing people to a right relationship with Jesus, we're pushing people away because we're not speaking to them in the correct way. He says in verse 3, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. And so Jesus asked the question, What what are you doing looking at the sliver in someone else's eye when you have this great big telephone pole sticking out of your own eye? Like you cannot, with the telephone pole in your eye, you cannot see clearly to pick out a splinter in somebody else's eye. Notice what Jesus says in verse number 5. You hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of the brother's eye. See, what Jesus is saying, he's not saying don't judge people and that nobody can judge anybody else and nobody can ever speak in anybody's life about sin going on. That's not what he was teaching. Verse 5 makes it clear. He says, first, you take care of your own problems. Deal with your own sin first, and then you are free and clear to, in a loving manner, help other people be able to see the sins that they have in their lives. So God speaks through people to correct us. And maybe God needs to use some people in your life to correct you. God needs to use people in my life to help correct me. And I'm thankful for those people. But am I listening for them? Are my ears open to receive the message that God wants to tell me through those people? The second way that we see that God speaks through people is to guide us. In 1 Samuel chapter number 3 in our text here, you you see the guidance that's given to Samuel through Eli. Verse number 8 says, And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for you did call me. Now notice what happens here. Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. See, Samuel didn't know. He had no idea it was God that was talking to him. He had no idea that it was God that was calling out his name. So he's just doing what he thinks is the right thing to do. I hear my name. I run to Eli to help him. And many of us, we just do what we think we need to do, but it's not necessarily the right thing to do. Sometimes we do things just because we've always done them that way. That's not the right reason to do anything. If your reason to do anything is because we've always done it that way, that's not the right way. And there's a lot of churches that do that. Hey, this is the way we've always done it, so this is the way we're always going to do it. No, that's not the right reason to do anything. You ought to know the reason why you do everything you do. But he's just doing what he thinks is the right thing. Until Eli guides him along. And God uses Eli to guide Samuel into a deeper relationship with himself. 
It says, Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Verse 9, Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be if he call thee that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. See, we see things based upon our own experiences and perspectives. That's how we see everything. We see everything through a filter of our own past, our own experiences, our own perspectives. But sometimes that means we're not seeing things clearly. Because our perspective can be skewed a little bit. Our experiences can be off. Samuel had never heard from God in this way. He'd never talked to God personally like this before. He had no idea what was happening. So God used Eli to guide Samuel into a conversation with God. We need people to help guide us as well. That's why God has given us pastors, teachers, parents, spiritual mentors in our life to help to guide us into a deeper relationship with God. He's given us people to help us. And we need those people in our lives. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. See, even the wisest person to ever live said, I need people around me that can help to guide me. That I can talk to, that I can bounce ideas off, that I can... Hey, let them know, this is what I'm thinking. Is this correct? What's your advice? What's your counsel? How can you help me? And we need those people, and I'm thankful for the people that God has put into my life that I can go and talk to, and they don't scream and holler at me for what I'm thinking. Man, you idiot, how could you ever think that? No, that I can pour out my heart, pour out my thoughts, pour out my ideas, and get some advice. And man, there's some people that you just can't do that with. There's been people in the past that I've tried to do that with. And rather than thinking logically and providing some counsel, like they jump off. Like, I can't believe you think that way. You heretic, what are you thinking? But I am thankful for the people that God has put in my life. You know, I think about Pastor Plinus and what a godly influence he's been on my life. And I know that I can talk to Pastor Plinus and he's going to sit, he's going to listen, and he's, then he's going to share his wealth and decades of experience with me and give me advice. I'm thankful for men like Pastor Ryan Livingston that I can talk to and say, hey, uh, what, are, what are you doing about this whole virus thing? What are you doing about the possibility of them shutting down churches from actually meeting together in a building? And I can get some advice and some suggestions from a man like him. I'm thankful for Dave Tyndall uh, that I can just talk to and get godly counsel and advice from. What a blessing it is to have these people in our lives. And I hope that you have people in your life that you can go and you can talk to. Man, if you ever want to talk to me, man, send me a message. You want to ask a question, you want to seek advice, I'm not going to jump down your throat. I'm not going to label you as an outcast because you have this doubt or this thought or need help. Like That's the whole point of what I am. What God sent me to do was to be a help and a blessing and to provide some guidance. And we have a lot of people around that. We've been blessed with wonderful deacons as well that have godly wisdom and counsel. Seek them out, their wives out. God speaks to pe- through people to guide us. And then God speaks through people to challenge us. Think of Esther chapter number 4 and verse number 13. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise of the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And here's a time 
where the Jews are going to be eradicated. And Esther, a Jew, is brought into the palace. And here Mordecai, he, he challenges Esther. And he says, listen, do you think that somehow just because you are married to the king, you're one of his concubines, do you really think that you're going to escape this judgment? Do you really think your dad is going to escape the decree to wipe out all Jews? No. And I love what he says here. He says, if you won't do something, God will raise up somebody else to do something. Man, the faith of Mordecai. And Mordecai understood something that a lot of us need to understand, and that is God doesn't need you. God does not need me to do anything. He doesn't need my mouth. He doesn't need my talent. He doesn't need my money. He does not need me at all. But we get the opportunity to serve Him. We get the opportunity to be blessed by being used by God. What a great thing that is. And that relieves a lot of weight off my shoulders because at a time like this when we can't necessarily meet together, that's a lot of weight on a pastor's shoulders. Because there's a lot of people looking to me for answers. And there's a lot of fear that, um, man, if we don't meet for a few weeks in a physical location, people might not come back when the doors do open. But God doesn't need me. Remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, I will build my church. So it's Jesus' church, and he has taken responsibility to build it. I don't, he doesn't need me to build it. He doesn't need you to build it. He did not need Esther to save the Jewish people. And Mordecai understood that. He said, if you won't do something, God can just as easily raise somebody else up from some other place to do what needs to be done. And the same is true for me and for you. If you won't step up and serve him, God will raise somebody else to do it. You just miss out on the blessing. If you won't tell that person about Jesus, God can easily raise up anybody else to do it. You just miss out on the opportunity. You miss out on the blessing of being a part of somebody being entered into the kingdom of God. He doesn't need us. But Mordecai challenges her and he says, listen, who knows if the very reason that you were brought into the kingdom in the first place was for just this moment in time. And that's an exciting thought. That gets me excited to think about the fact that God raised me up and led me to this place for such a time as this. To lead this congregation through this moment in time. Through these difficulties, these challenges. I mean, you talk about a halftime coach pep talk. I can see Esther, man, charged up. She's ready to go. She's ready to just rush in and save the people. I think about, as I mentioned, I enjoy watching movies. And um, think about the motivational speeches from movies. And I'm kind of curious what your favorite motivational speech from a movie is. If you're watching this online, I want you to tell me in the comments what is your favorite motivational speech from a movie. I'm kind of interested in that. So please let me know in the comments. I think about some of the, the most famous of all time that, that, are, that I enjoy. So you think about Braveheart. That speech from Mel Gibson where he has all the troops lined up on their horse. All the troops are lined up. He's on his horse kind of riding back and forth giving this great motivational speech where he talks about they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. Man, I was ready to do battle after that. Let's go. Let's get the swords out. Let's fight. I mean, you talk about a powerful motivational speech. What about more one that's a little more recent in, in the movie Rocky Balboa? And Rocky is speaking to his son, and he says these words that are so powerful, so moving. He says, it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit 
and keep moving forward. And man, what a great speech that is. Because there are times where life just hits us. I mean, right now, life is hitting a lot of people. And through this circumstance that we're in right now, it's going to have lasting repercussions, long-lasting repercussions. Down the line, even, economically and whatever else, people are going to have a hard time. The Bible says that a just man falls down seven times and he gets up again. But when I hear this speech, like, I'm ready, to, I'm ready to get in the ring. Let's do some boxing. I don't know the first thing about boxing. I don't know the first thing about fighting. But, man, I'm ready. Let's get the gloves on. Let's do this. But I think my all-time favorite motivational speech is from the movie Independence Day. Will Smith, Bill Pullman in that movie. And Bill Pullman is the president And aliens have come down and have invaded earth. They're going to wipe out the earth. And so they're gathering all the troops, anybody they can, for this last assault on the alien species that's taking over the world. And Bill Pullman steps up as the troops are all gathered together and getting ready. And he says, good morning. Good morning. In less than an hour, aircrafts from here will join others from around the world. and You will be launching the largest aerial battle in the history of mankind. Mankind. That word should have new meaning for all of us today. We can't be consumed by our petty differences anymore. We will be united in our common interest. Perhaps it's fate that today is the 4th of July and you will once again be fighting for our freedom. Not from tyranny, oppression, or persecution, but from annihilation. We're fighting for our right to live, to exist. And should we win today, the 4th of July will no longer be known as an American holiday, But as the day when the world declared in one voice, we will not go quietly into the night. We will not vanish without a fight. We're going to live on. We're going to survive. Today we celebrate our Independence Day. And of course at that point, the music crescendos, all the troops are cheering. And I still get goosebumps when I hear it, when I watch that. Think about the people that God has used in our lives to challenge us, to motivate us, to encourage us. Man, we need to challenge one another. We need to support, encourage, and motivate each other. Think about, that's the whole point of the church in the first place. Hebrews chapter number 10, verse 24 says, And let us consider one another. To provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. He says the point of gathering together, whether we gather in person, whether we gather online, the point of the gathering is to provoke unto love and to good works. That word provoke is the idea of to stir something up, to incite. It's like taking the little fire poker and stirring up the coals to ignite the fire. That's what that word provoke means. To stir each other up. Just as each of these individuals in these movies that we talked about stirred up the people, stirred up individuals stirred up groups to accomplish something. He says that's what you and I are to do for each other. We are to stir up love and good works in one another. I wonder who have you taken time to stir up to love and to good works today? Because maybe... At this moment in somebody's life, those coals inside of them are getting kind of cold. And they need somebody like you 
come stir up the love and the good works in them. It's that fire and that passion for God can be reunited. That that flame inside of them can be stirred up to love and to help the people that are in their life, stirred up to carry the gospel to a world that so desperately needs it. There's not a lot of hope in the world right now. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of panic. And God wants to use you to challenge somebody else today. God wants to use you like that coach at halftime to stir them up inside. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't turn your back on God. Don't lose heart. Don't lose hope. Don't let fear control and dominate your life. God wants to use people to speak to you, to speak to me. Sometimes He uses those people to correct us. Sometimes He uses those people to kind of guide us in the way that we should go. Sometimes He uses those people to challenge, encourage us, to stir us up, to continue on. The question is, Are you listening? God wants to speak to you through people in your life. Sometimes it's people you know. Sometimes it's just random strangers. And so every single one of us need to make that prayer that Samuel prayed. God, speak. I'm your servant. And I am listening. I'm ready to hear what you want to tell me through the people in my life, speak to me.